people today are having health issues with gluten, so I'm going to show you the perfect alternative to pasta. What we have here is zucchini. I've got a local zucchini grown by a farmer here and sold at Palafox Market. And this is an organic zucchini that was bought at Everman's in local. If you don't have access to organic, you're going to want to make sure to peel your zucchini. In choosing it, you want to choose a very straight one to make your pasta with. So I'm going to show you how to do this. I'm going to peel part of this off. If it is organic, you don't need to do this. And then I'm going to cut a little piece here. This machine is a spiral slicer. It's a Joyce Chin. There are several models out there. We sell this one here. You put your zucchini in there and twist. That little piece of zucchini is going to make a whole plate of pasta. There it is. You put it in your dish, put a little marinara sauce on it, or any kind of sauce that you choose, pesto, alfredo, and you have the perfect gluten-free meal. Have you ever wondered why you can't get a great cup of coffee at home, but you can go to a great coffee shop like the Bodacious Brew and get a consistent, great beverage? Well, here are some tips. The difference is math and science. Science, the temperature has to be at least 195 to 205. A lot of your home brewers at home will not receive that temperature. So there's one problem. Number two is your grind size. You need to make sure that you have the right size. If it's too thick, if it's too coarse, it'll create a very thick cup of coffee and you'll get a muddy mess. Next is, is your grind is too coarse and it'll just pour right through. So you need the right grind size. Next is your freshness. You need to grind fresh and to the minute if possible. Next is your ratio. You want the proper ratio. This is the math. You need to use 1.75 grams of dry coffee for every ounce. So there you go. Those are great ways to get started on a great cup of coffee at your own home. Come see us at The Brew and we'll give you all the tips you need. We have many new silicone products at So Gourmet. The silicone these days, good ones, are made of platinum silicone, which is actually what they use in hospitals for their silicone things. So it's food grade platinum silicone. This is one of my favorite toys for this, from the silicone line. It's a lemon or lime juicer. You take your lemon or lime, cut off the end, put it in the juicer, looks like this. You can squeeze out the juice, the seeds don't come out. Then when you're finished, you close it up, put it in your refrigerator and it preserves the life of your lemon or lime. Here at So Gourmet, we have so many fun and truly useful gadgets that make life a little easier in the kitchen. This cheese grater is one of my absolute favorites. You just cut off a nice piece of cheese, load it in here, and this is going to apply all the pressure for you, so there's no need to be pressing and pushing and squeezing. You just do the ratchet, and there you go. Everybody loves freshly grated cheese, and it's that easy. wondered why there's so many different types and styles of swimwear available? There is a reason behind every shape and size of glass that you see in the market. The style and the grape variety of the wine can make a huge difference in how you perceive and taste each wine. A sparkling wine is shown best in a long bowl that tapers towards the top. This also makes it um, a prettier presentation as the bubbles travel a longer distance and it concentrates the aromas of the subtle differences between different sparkling wines. In a Sauvignon Blanc glass, 
you need a little bit more surface area at the bottom so that you can get all of the different scents off of the wine, as well as a nice taper to concentrate it towards your nose. There's also a difference in the way that a tapered bowl will hit your tongue and you can get all of the different flavors to the different taste buds and taste all of the different uh, intricacies within that wine. So you'll get the taper as well as the larger surface area. Then you have a Riesling glass, which is a little bit smaller because Riesling tends to be a very aromatic grape variety, so you don't need quite as much surface area um, in order to not overpower your olfactory. You also have a smaller taper at the top with Riesling because the tip of your tongue tends to perceive sweetness first, and you don't want to only perceive the sweetness in the wine. So as, the ta as it tapers towards the top, when you drink it, it will actually hit the middle of your tongue, and that makes it easier to appreciate all of the flavors that the Riesling has to offer. A wider bowl is often used for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir grapes. That's because in Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, you have more subtle differences in the uh, wine's characteristics, and you want a wider bowl in order to smell all of those different intricate flavors. You don't have quite the taper at the top because you want to be able to smell and get every subtle difference in different wines. Then with a Cabernet glass, you have a longer bowl, a longer stem, and about the same amount of surface area at the bottom. You need a bigger glass for Cabernet because it's a very big, powerful wine, and you need as much area in the glass so that when you swirl, all of the aromas can concentrate together, and then they can be concentrated towards your nose and palate. That is also tapered a little bit more towards the top in order to go towards the middle of your tongue and not overpower any one in particular uh, taste bud. And that is why there's so many different styles of glasses available. Many of us look at our microwave as a tool to reheat our leftovers. The truth is you can make a wonderful, nutritious breakfast quickly. It's something like this. This is the silicone microwave. You take this product, you put a little olive oil in, break your egg in there. You can add spinach, tomatoes, cheese, and vegetables. Close it back up, put it in the microwave for 40 to 60 seconds, and you have a nice, healthy breakfast. When you choose your flowers, whether it be the grocery store or farmer's market, if you're buying by the bunch, just a couple quick tips on how to um, prepare them, how to condition them, how to hydrate them, all very important in the lifespan of a flower. So typically they will come um, in a bundle of 10 stems. These are Suji Moms, and I can tell they're slightly dehydrated. They've just come in off of a truck from Miami. And so, a little bit of a tip. If something comes with a wrapper around the head of the flower, it's good to leave it on until it's hydrated. What you want to do is strip the leaves, and that allows for the water to go straight up the stem and reach the flower head first. So the water will reach whatever it gets to first. So if you strip the leaves off, then the water will go directly to the top of the flower, hydrate it to its fullest. Once it's hydrated, you want to remove any kind of netting, and, um, and we're going to give it a little cut. So we're going to take the rubber band off. You want all flowers to have a little bit of air to just really hydrate. Um, so what we'll do, and I use my hands, but you can use a knife, you can use scissors, and you just take most of the leaves off. I like to leave a little bit at the top just for the beauty of it. And we're going to give it a little cut and we're going to let it sit in there and if you're in a hurry which most people are these days just do a couple of times sometimes i'll hold them in my hand and strip them we'll give them a little cut at an angle again this allows for the most water the largest increase of water if you cut a stem at an angle so we're going to let those hydrate some of these leaves off and again you don't want the leaves in the water it builds up bacteria causes everything to die faster and if you choose you can put just a little tiny splash of bleach and that will help 
cut down on the bacteria. You don't need much. It's not going to kill the flowers, but you will see if you do over pour a little bit, the stems will um, lighten in color, but it typically will not hurt the flower. So again, here's another bunch. These are roses. Roses typically have thorns. So that's another thing. When working with the roses, it makes it a little bit easier to go ahead and dethorn them. When you're working them into an arrangement, if they are covered in thorns, they tend to catch and it makes it a little bit harder to design. So we're just going to take off a couple of flower um, leaves. These aren't too bad. But any of the thorns, we're going to go ahead and cut them off. And um, again, sometimes I start to cluster them just for time. Take any thorns off, give them a nice good cut, sharp pencil on an angle, and allow for them to hydrate. So I just take the thorns right off. Um, one flower that tends to wilt quickly is a hydrangea, and they're very southern flower. You can cut them off the bushes when they're blooming, and I'm going to give you a little trick on how to rehydrate a hydrangea. If you have cut the stem and put it in water and it has not hydrated, you can do a little trick take the flower bloom and you literally submerge the bloom in water and it is one type of flower that takes the flower the water in through the petals and so you leave it there for about an hour and then when you take it out it should be rehydrated give the bottom a fresh cut and 80% of the time your hydrangea will come back to life how do you make the perfect meatball or the perfect meatloaf? There's a secret to it, and I'll show you how. First of all, you want to start with quality meats. The meats that are required for an authentic Italian meatball would be ground veal, ground pork, and just a small amount of ground beef. You don't want a lean ground beef. It needs to be a regular ground beef that has a little bit of fat content. That fat content uh, releases enough fat to, to render flavor into the meatball. So as you can see on this, we've got two thirds the veal and the pork and one third the ground beef. So more veal and pork and less ground beef. Some Italians use ground sausage as well and you can, you can include that if you choose to. So they're the quality meats that you want. We have those already mixed together in the bowl. The other ingredients that you need are two eggs. The eggs need to be at room temperature. Almost always, when you use eggs, they should be at room temperature, unless you're doing a, a dough, pastry, pie crust, something like that, in which case they need to be cold. We're gonna add a little bit of Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese, and it's shredded. That adds a little bit of salt to it, so you don't have to add as much sodium to it. Having said that, we're gonna sprinkle just a little bit of sea salt into it, and a little bit of black pepper. Additionally, we're gonna use ground basil and ground oregano. These are fresh herbs that I'm adding today. If you're using dry herbs, you need to use less because dry herbs are much stronger than fresh herbs. Lastly, we're gonna add a little bit of crushed red pepper. That'll add a little kick to it. If you don't care for red pepper, then you can omit that. Um, also, let's add a little onion powder. Onion powder is one of my favorite ingredients and it's little known, little used, but I think it's a nice secret to foods. Okay, we're going to mix this together. Have to get your hands a little dirty on this one. One important thing to point out is that anytime that you're using ground beef, ground pork, veal, whichever, you don't want to overhandle it. If you handle it too much, then it's going to be tough and you won't get that nice moisture without too much density. Okay, now having mixed that, the most important ingredient the secret ingredient for the best meatloaf and best meatballs is milk. We almost always add breadcrumbs, don't we? This today I'm doing gluten-free. I've used rolled oats like you would use in oatmeal. And what I did was pulse them just for a few minutes in a food processor to make them smaller in a breadcrumb consistency. And then I added milk. In this case, it was half and half, which is half milk, half cream. And you want to add this instead of breading 
to your meat mixture. Again, it's, it's the milk that adds in the moisture and prevents your meat from drying out in baking. So let's incorporate that nicely, again, without overhandling it too much. And once we've done that, this is the consistency that you want. I know it looks a little wet, a little um, almost soupy, but that's going to translate into nice moisture when you cook them. And of course, you can make these any size that you want. You could do small sizes of meatballs. Again, they're wet. Don't be turned off by it. If they're too wet for your preference, just add a little more of the oats or breadcrumbs. Or you can make a larger meatball like the Italians traditionally do. You wanna bake these for about seven to 12 minutes on 375. And having done that earlier in the interest of time, let's show you how they turned out. This is a finished meatball. We're gonna cut into it and show you how nice and moist it is. As you can see, it's not terribly dense. It has a lot of moisture to it. It's perfect. That's the secret to the perfect meatball or meatloaf. It's milk, enjoy. Of all the fun gadgets we have here at So Gourmet, this rice cube is one that truly delights. It's super easy to use and a lot of fun. You just load up your rice in here and you get to be hands on and squish it in there. And then close it. Give it a little squeeze. And you have a perfect little rice cube that's beautiful for presentation. Or you can put in some veggies for filling. You could use um, any fruit, also anything. So we're going to do a little carrot in here, a little green onion, and some cucumber. and then add your rice back on top. Give it that nice squeeze. And then you've got a fun little rice cube with filling. And then another great addition to these when you're doing the veggie fillings or just the plain rice is our sesame oil. It's Fabulous on these, give it a little drizzle, and the flavor is just amazing. And look at that, it's beautiful. Many of us think of our microwave as a tool to only reheat our leftovers. With the proper tool, you can make a complete meal, save electricity, reduce heat in your kitchen, and preserve the nutrients in your food. This is a LaCroix steamer. Simply place your food in here on top of the steam tray, put liquid in the bottom, close it up, put it in your microwave, three to five minutes and you have a complete healthy meal. In our cooking classes, I'm often asked how to select, prep, and cook the perfect piece of meat. So let me show you how. We have some chicken here bone in and we have a pork loin. One of the most important things I can share with you is that when you're buying any cut of meat, you wanna make sure that if you have multiple pieces, that they're all relatively the same size. The reason being that you'll have the, the same cooking time, so your doneness is the same. Um, in doing chicken, bone in, boneless, of course they're gonna be separate thicknesses. So if you've got one piece that's bone in, one piece that's boneless, because the boneless is gonna be thinner, you have to monitor your internal temperature more closely. With a pork loin, it's all one piece. So you know that all pieces, the whole thing is gonna be done at the same time. So one thing that's really important in prepping meat is brining. If you don't brine your meats, you should. It's a really important step to ensuring a moist, healthy piece of meat. Let me explain how brining works. 
What you do is take a bowl of water. You can put it in any kind of container of your choice. You're going to take the choice of meat, put it in the water. You want to add two cups of salt per gallon of water. We don't have quite a gallon here, so I'm only adding one cup of salt. I've chosen to use kosher sea salt here because the granules are a little larger and I can better gauge exactly how much I've added. Then you want to take fresh herbs. This is a little thyme. We have some fresh sage and some fresh rosemary. You can add juniper berries, you can add capers if you want a more salty flavor, whatever you want. Now, what you're gonna do is put this in your refrigerator and let it sit for 24 hours. You can do it longer, you can do it for three days if you want, doesn't matter, the meat will be fine. But at least 24 hours is a good rule. Having said that, you can do it very short, you know, an hour or two if it's a smaller piece of meat or you don't want it to brine that long. So, after it has sat in the refrigerator for a 24 hour period, Let's remove it from the brine water. We're gonna transfer it to a dry bowl. This is a very important step in the brining process. You want it to sit in the refrigerator outside of the brine for an additional 24 hours. After that, it's ready to remove and begin our seasoning. Now, because we salted the brine water, there's no need in re-salting this for seasoning. In fact, you wanna wash it off to make sure that there's not any excess salt on it. We're going to transfer it to the pan. You want to dry it off. Meats should almost always be dried before you begin seasoning. Get all the extra moisture off. And again, we're not going to salt it. We're going to use some of our butter flavored olive oil to coat it nicely so that the meat stays moist on the outside. Use your hands and coat it generously. We're gonna add a little bit of pepper. Aim high with your seasoning so that you don't have unwanted clusters of any seasoning. I like a lot of black pepper on mine. It gives it kind of a, a little kick and a little crust to the outside. We're gonna add a little bit more of the thyme. You can sprinkle it more with um, rosemary if you want. And then the other ingredient that we've used is our Mission Fig Balsamic Vinegar. This is a wonderful glaze on pork, on seafood, on beef. And we're just going to spread it over and it becomes almost like a glaze. We're gonna put this in the oven and we're gonna bake it at 375 until the internal temperature is 143. Then we're gonna remove it from the oven It'll do what we call carryover cooking, where the meat, any meat does this, it will raise a degree a minute in temperature. So we're gonna pull it at 143, but we want it to sit out for just a minute and let the temperature move up to about 145 internally. That'll only take about 20 minutes or so. In the interest of time, we have one already prepared. This is the same loin with the Mission Big Balsamic. Isn't that nice? It has just a little coating of the balsamic to add a little sweetness to it. We're gonna cut into this. Just gonna cut it at an angle to make really pretty medallions. And then we're going to fan them out on our plate to create a beautiful presentation. And on this plate, what we've done, I've used some of our tarragon Dijon mustard and some of our apricot lavender chutney. There you have, that's how you select, prep, and cook a perfect piece of meat. Brining makes all the difference, enjoy. are healthy for you. They're a good source of fat, they're good for your skin, they're good for your heart, and they have great antioxidants in them. But not all olive oils are made the same. 69% of the olive oils that are sold in the stores today are not pure olive oils. So how do you know if you're getting a good quality olive oil? 
You're going to want to look for a bottle that's dark. You don't want any light coming through here. It compromises the olive oil. You want to look for a crush date, which tells you when it was actually crushed. It needs to say extra virgin. It can't just say olive oil. And also you want to have the estate where that olive oil, where the olive was grown, and that way you know exactly where it's coming from. The olive oils that we carry at the Bodacious Olive are hand-picked. They have a high polyphenol content, which you can taste. They have the crush date, and also our bottles are dark, so you'll know that you're getting good quality when you come to the Bodacious Olive. What are the essential knives for every kitchen? Let me show you my recommendations. The first knife that you should have is probably a chef's knife. They come in different sizes. You can have an eight, nine, or even 10 inch chef's knife. You can have a smaller five and a half to six inch chef knife. These are straight edge. The straight edge chef knife are good for a clean chop or dice. They rock back and forth easily on your board to give you a nice cut. Another chef's knife that you may want to use is a Santoku. Notice the shape on this. It's a little different. It has a curved front edge to it. That makes it nice for rocking back and forth. The ribs that you see in it are called hollow ground, and that's nice for if you're cutting celery or onions or something of that nature. These air rivets prevent it from pulling and dragging your food as you cut it. Another knife that's good to have is a boning knife. You can get one like this that's rigid, or you can get one that has a little flexibility to it. This is wonderful for cutting up chicken. It's also good if you want to make a thin slice into a piece of fish or salmon because it's got a very thin straight edge. That's a good one to have as well. Every kitchen needs a paring knife. It's nice for peeling, even dicing or chopping like herbs or whatever when you just want a little bit of a chopping action. A bonus knife to have in your kitchen is a good quality bread knife. For obvious reasons, it cuts bread nice and clean without shredding it. Now, a knife that is a, another extra bonus in your kitchen, but I love it, I think you have to have one, is a tomato knife. Notice that it has the serrated edge and it has a forked tongue to it, so that if you want to pierce the tomato to remove seeds, this one does it nicely. But look how easily and effortlessly this cuts through this tomato. See what a clean edge it gives you? So invest in these essential kitchen knives to make life in the kitchen more fun for everyday gourmet meals.